Well, my dear friend, as I call you, Eva. Yeah, I know it's Eva. But no, it's Eva. It's Eva. Eva when you say Eva, it you right. See? Eva, Eva, I'm the only one that pronounces right. I have the best. And your, and your husband. <laughs> um, welcome to Longer Tables. I'm so happy you're here with me. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I wish we were at an actual table eating together. Well, uh, yeah, we can make something happen about that. <laughs> I think at the end we're going to eat together. Just, just wait and see. Uh, the other day I saw you in Austin, uh, South by Southwest. Uh, I was so happy to give you a hug and see your little know, one. He's awesome, Santi. Um, but every time I see you, you are always busy. You are always on the move. You, you, you are so many things at, at once. <laughs> uh, I think everybody wants to know me first. What, what is an average day? for you, Eva? <laughs> oh my God. Every day is different. Every day is different. Um, you know, I, I prioritize things as they come. So right now my, the premiere of my directorial debut, uh, is priority. So I've been doing a lot of press for that this past week. Uh, sometimes my tequila Casa del Sol is priority because I have to travel all over the country and talk about it. And then this week is sleep and my birthday and, um, and uh, I have to go to my son's school. So <laughs> every day. You need to be a mom and you need to be a person. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I didn't <laughs> receive my invitation, but that's okay. Wait for but, it. But, uh, no, because the only thing I'm doing is sleeping. <laughs> sleeping. That's a good sleeping. gift. Yes, this a is a great gift. gift. This great is gift. a good gift. So, <laughs> so obviously, but you, you've been getting into so many different things. But what I love is to have somebody like you so into anything that has to do with food. You, yeah. you have the, the podcast called Hungry for History, yeah. uh, uh, and your new TV show is Searching for Mexico, where you are kind of uh, looking into the connections between Mexico and America. Yeah. Fascinating. So, so for me, what I want to know is, if anything, I am from Spain, yeah. Like you, we are sisters and brothers. We are. We're from the same so place in Spain. We come from different places, but everybody makes me an expert on Spanish cooking. Uh -huh. But the most I travel through Spain, as I am 53 now, the more I know that I know nothing. Uh -huh. It's always something somewhere. So as you are doing this search of Mexico, of who you are in, in many ways, we are what we eat. Tell me what yeah. you eat and I'll tell you who you are. W yeah. What, if anything, you found in Mexico that really surprised you about their people, about the recipes, oh. about the traditions, things yeah. that all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, this, this is so powerful. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting that you and I are having this conversation because it, my ancestry is from Spain, from Asturias, where, where you're from. Um, but I'm 13th generation American, uh, the Americas because my gr 13th great grandfather landed in Veracruz in 1603. So, so we have a, a strong identity with new Spain slash Mexico slash United States, Texas. Right. Um, but when they asked me to do the show, I was so excited because the identity of Mexican food is tacos, tequila, tacos, tequila, which they do very well. Right. Like I love tacos and tequila. Uh, but, it's so much more than that. And that's the biggest thing. I knew that, but I didn't experience it like I did, obviously, searching for Mexico. We did six different states, Jalisco, Nuevo León, Yucatan, um, uh, Veracruz, Mexico, Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City, and Oaxaca. And so even my husband, who's Mexican, traveled with me. And he was like, I've never had this dish. I've never heard of this ingredient. I've never, you know. And so for me, it was really what, that, you know, going beyond tacos tequila, which you'll see in the show. And also the people. Like if you're talking about the food of a nation, you're talking about its people. And it's, and it's history told through food because there's such an evolution um, and a history lesson in food. And if you look at mole, you know, in Mexico, it's an exact hybrid of, of colonization and indigenous ingredients. And so it's a perfect dish that explains what happened and when it happened, when it came to be, because it, it mole wouldn't exist without some ingredients from Spain. 
and it wouldn't exist without the indigenous techniques. Uh, and so it's interesting. You can see the history of a country in its food. Yeah. I, I, for me, the discovery of, of, of mole was one of these dishes. In this case, a sauce that is a dish or a dish that is a sauce. Uh, and obviously, it's many moles. But yeah. then when you start reading about the ingredients and how the ingredients came to be and how different people from faraway places in a, uh, through centuries, uh, they created something like shows you that, that we all need to be building longer tables, like the name of my <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it's dark moments in the history of civilizations. Unfortunately, that's humanity at its worst. But if anything, food is something like shines through. That if it's some legacy uh, of, of dark moments in history is when, when food through centuries just becomes richer. You, listen, 1492, uh, the Catholic uh, kings expelling all the Jewish people uh, from Spain. Well, that was a dark moment of history. Yeah. Going forward 500 years, all the Sephardic cooking that developed in Spain around the Mediterranean, culinarily, we are richer. And yeah. this is what is amazing to know the history of the dishes, uh, of the dishes yeah. we eat, well, of, of the dishes we are. 100%. And I do, I agree with what you're saying because there's a celebration when you eat food. And so even though specifically in Mexico, you look at it at the brutality of the colonization, right? Um, and we recognize that and you see that because Mexico was a predominantly vegetarian society before the Spaniards arrived. So the cow, the pig, the goat, dairy, cheese, none of that would have existed uh, uh, if the Spaniards had never arrived. And the identity of Nuevo León is carne asada, carne asada, carne asada. The identity of the Yucatan is cochinita pibil, cochinita pibil. Like, you go, wow, this is a beautiful thing that did come out of some some traumatic history. And so you're right. Like, if you could celebrate, you know, that, that um, how food kind of, like, comes through uh, uh, as either – a protest like no no we're gonna we're gonna take your ingredient and then we're gonna make it our own and that's what happens like with cochinita pibil it's used with all indigenous spices but it's the pork so i think that's a beautiful you know beautiful fusions that happen um through the history of of con countries all countries so you already ma mentioned many dishes but uh, the the first thing i realized the power of mexican cooking uh -huh. was in a little market in one of the little towns outside Oaxaca. I love to go to those markets. Every day is a different market in one little town in the valley. And there was this woman, by, by the way, our woman that feed the world. No, no men and boys like me. In every corner around the world, the seven, eight billion people we are is always the woman feeding the world. They, mm -hmm. they, you woman carry that responsibility. And was this older woman beautifully dressed with a little comal in front of her. She had masa and she had the biggest basket of, uh, uh, of uh, flores de calabaza, the squash blossoms I've seen in my life. You could smell them. And she will get the traditional Oaxacan cheese. She mm -hmm. will make the big tortilla from scratch, put it on the comal. She will put a whole bunch of flowers and the cheese then she will put water with her finger in the edges. She will close the tortilla over. That was the best quesadilla I yeah. ate in my life to this day. Yeah. Because it's simplicity. This is something like is my North Star. Mm. When I think about, not only about Mexican cooking, when I think about cooking, yeah. I remember that quesadilla as being pure, yeah. sophisticated, traditional but modern yeah. and where all the ingredients shine at once that dish yeah. still to this day is is a dish i remember continuously mm -hmm. if anything what was that dish for you in, in this uh, last trip you took where you were concentrating making the show 
and in the process you are discovering those things. You already mentioned two or three, but what's yeah. one that you say, oh my God? Well, it's so funny you mentioned quesillo because uh, quesillo is Oaxacan cheese. If, you, if you're outside of Oaxaca, you say Oaxacan cheese, but if you're in Oaxaca, they get very angry if you don't call it quesillo. They're like, it's called quesillo. But it was an accident. Again, another happy accident because, again, Mexicans, we, uh, indigenous cultures didn't have dairy. We didn't have the cow. And so cheese is a new thing to Mexico. And then when you look at the cuisine of Mexico, it all has cheese now. So um, quesillos uh, was an accident when a little girl didn't, con didn't watch the cheese and it started to curdle and she panicked. And so she poured hot water into the cheese uh, and, and then it, it got hard. And so she tried to stretch it and, and tried to fix it before her parents got home. And then she made basically the first string cheese of the world because she was trying to fix it. And it was the happiest, best accident ever, quesillo. The best quesadillas uh, are with cheese from Oaxaca. Um, but for me, at, it, we were in the Yucatan. I was in a tiny little hut. And a chef took me to his mother's house. And I say house because it was a palapa with dirt floor. And she was Mayan, didn't speak Spanish. Like uh, Mayan, she only spoke Mayan. She, she never learned Spanish. And she made these tamales. And in the Yucatan, like I'm from Texas, so the tamales we make are with the masa and you wrap it in a corn husk and you fill it with pork and you steam it in... The Yucatan, they they wrap it in a banana leaf and they put it in a pibil underground. So they cook it underground so that the tamale comes out cr hard, like crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. Uh, and it cooks for hours underground in a banana leaf. So it was like very different and very different flavors, obviously. But, you know, she's talking to me in Mayan uh, as her son is translating and I could just feel her judging me because I wasn't rolling the, the tamales as well as she, <laughs> as well as she, well, I was like sweating. I was like, Oh my God, she's judging me. I said, I have made tamales before, but I haven't made these. Um, anyway, they were amazing and not only amazing, like taste wise, but the, they, the, the ancient technique that they use it, it cooking underground in the ground in the, in the pib is still how they cook most things. It's and so th the the ancient techniques mixed with modern uh, ingredients is really to me it was just fascinating to learn to eat it. And then she made a salsa that was super indigenous. It was just of seeds and nopal, um, you know, cactus uh, and chile. Like it was a super indigenous salsa on top of this, um, you know hybrid of culture of a tamale it was it was just it was it was a moment to remember and they they blessed you know they they say a huge blessing for food every time they thank the earth there's such a connection to the earth and what the earth gives you so you you can't even begin to cook with the ingredients unless you say thank you to the earth and that was a beautiful ceremony we did so we're gonna see you in your show trying to make uh, tamales that's the type of things we will see mayan that one was the mayan tamales the i mayan. I make a mole in Oaxaca. I go fishing in Jalisco. I, I make birria in Jalisco as well. Wow. Um, I do a huge carne asada in Nuevo León, in Monterrey in the north, which is very much like Texas. Um, they take their meat very seriously, and they do these. In, carne asada is not, it's not a noun. It's like a way of life. <laughs> so people of longer tables people of america people of the world march 26 searching for mexico on cnn with the only the one eva longoria we cannot wait so i'm gonna take you somewhere else right okay. now i'm from spain the only thing i ever knew when i was young was spanish cooking but i got highly interested in learning about other Cuisines. other cuisines mm -hmm. Because I want to learn and I want to share with others what I learn. Um, I have a Mexican restaurant. Oh, Oyamel. wow. No way. Uh, and we're friends and, uh, and you didn't know that one. I didn't Oyamel. know that. Where is Como, it? In D.C.? In D.C., 20 years. I have a Mexican Chinese restaurant, which, by the way, is not my invention. That's something that like happened in Mexico through history where Chinese 
people coming from California to build a railway. They move to Mexicali, and there you find all these Chinese descendants, Mexican Chinese, and where you find a mix of traditional dishes and ingredients of Mexico mixed with traditional uh, Chinese ingredients and or techniques. Um, but what I'm going to ask you is this. Uh, it's been this kind of, uh, over the last years, if, in this case, a chef from Spain can be cooking mm -hmm. uh, Mexican or not. N nobody has ever told me anything. Uh, but my argument will be, in my Spanish restaurant, uh -huh. my success in my Spanish restaurant, that this year I'm celebrating 30 years, Jaleo, you know who has been cooking Spanish cooking for the last 30 years? Yes, I have some Spaniards, but I've been having people from Bolivia, people from mm -hmm. Salvador, people from Mexico. Yeah. And if you eat the food, the only thing you will know is, is good or is not. And I it's tell you, it's great. So yeah. what I'm only saying is, my opinion is that this is nonsense. Because you can have amazing chefs from other countries yeah. doing the best paella ever. Some of my the best paella I ever eaten are many amazing individuals from Central America that were with me. Uh -huh. I sent them to Spain. They trained. Over the years, they became masters. So me, I also have a Mexican restaurant. Obviously, I have Mexican people in the restaurants. They help me be better. I learned. What is your thoughts about that? Don't you think like we all should be free to, to cook and celebrate other cultures? Yes, yes, or yes? Yeah, I mean, not only sh we should be free, we should be doing it because um, the easiest way into another culture is food. You can go to China and not speak Chinese and have a great cultural experience because of the food. You can go to India and eat the food and you go, oh, I get it. There's something that unlocks a culture um, you know, that, that, that food holds the key to. And so not only, you know, yes, we should be free to do it. We should be doing it. And that's the reason I wanted to do this show is because a lot of times, you know, the people who villainize Mexicans in this country are the same people that are going taco Tuesday, you know, margaritas, guacamole, guacamole. And you're like, yeah, but that comes from somewhere. So why, and again, food is intricately tied to the people. And so it's, 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 I'm hoping that the show opens, opens some people's eyes to the beautiful country that Mexico is and, and the beautiful people in that country. So you mentioned the tacos before, taco, 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 tequila, taco, margarita. So yes, taco now, I think, obviously for Mexico in the state seems everything, um, is taco, but, but yes, you've been, you've been asking people to be more adventurous in exploring Mexican cuisine, to move beyond the staples. Uh, uh, so, so next time any of our listeners in America go for Mexican food, what, what do you think they should try? Used to start this kind of, and moving away from taco, taco, taco. Um, first of all, I think Mexico has some of the best breakfasts in the world. Um, and uh, if you go to a Mexican restaurant for breakfast, the, the menu's endless. Chilaquiles, uh, huevos rancheros, huevos divorciados, molletes. I mean, we have so much for breakfast. When I was shooting in Spain for, for six months, it was like a, a, a piece of bread and coffee. That's your breakfast. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes a tortilla de patata in a piece of bread. Uh, um, but it's funny because a lot of countries don't do that big breakfast. Like American breakfast is different. English breakfast is obviously different, but Mexican breakfast, it has the most. So I would say start with the breakfasts because there's such a variety. It's such, such fun. Like people have really long breakfasts in Mexico. So uh, we will do breakfast from now on because we're going to follow the guidance of our Mexican ambassador, Eva Longoria. <laughs> uh, 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 Mexican breakfast, I agree with you. I, every time I go to Mexico, is, if I skip one meal because I don't want to overeat, it's not breakfast. I have breakfast and then I may have lunch and or dinner. I yeah. agree with you that breakfast <laughs> in Mexico is exceptional. So, so uh, when, when you were younger... You, you wanted to be uh, an athletic uh, trainer or physical therapist. Uh, I think you enter a beauty 
contests in in the hopes of winning money for college tuition you kind of won you 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 kept winning in a way that led you to hollywood yeah. uh, uh your mom was the one cooking like my mom was the one yeah. cooking even working outside home uh your mom will make all types of of different uh, uh dishes uh, uh i think you, you are a great cook you cook for your son every time you are around the house and and yeah. you can do it or even when you go uh, away so you grew up in Texas. Yes, you have this Spanish background from Asturias, Mexican background, American background. Yeah. So, so wow. I mean, you, you, you have different continents uh, uh, influences. My DNA uh, what, and my DNA. <laughs> so what were your, your family meals as a kid? What, what do you remember mm. of being a young Eva yeah. Longoria growing up? Yeah. in a household with so many influences in a way. Well, I will tell you, there's very there's staples in a Texican household because I'm technically a Texican. Um, but my um, we grew up on a ranch and my dad grew food. And so we were not allowed to eat out. We couldn't eat fast food. We couldn't go to a restaurant. My dad was like, the land will give us everything. So if it was calabaza season, we had calabaza con carne, calabaza con pollo, calabaza con... Like, it was like, I hate calabaza, I hate squash, why are we eating so much? And we had to wait till it ran out of season. And then it was watermelon season, and we had watermelon, you know, water. We had watermelon for breakfast. We had water. I mean, it was like, we... My dad um, really, really taught us um, where food comes from. We had to plant it. We had to take care of it, you know. And I remember um, my mom sometimes on Fridays, if she got paid, would buy us a Domino's pizza as a secret. And we would eat it and we would throw away the pizza boxes in our neighbor's trash can because if my dad knew that we did not eat from the land, he would have been mad. Um, so I grew up very much like that for a very long time. Um, and then also with, I grew up with flour tortillas. So flour tortillas in my house is bread. Like, I'm not a big bread eater, but there was always flour tortillas on the table. Um, and my husband's from Mexico, is Mexican, Mexico, so he's corn tortillas. So we have this fight in our house all the time. Um, and refried beans. Like, if there's always beans. I always, I make beans two times a week in huge, you know, huge uh, uh, quantities. And we just go through them. We have them with everything. We have them for breakfast. We have them for lunch. We have them for dinner. And specifically with the flour tortilla. So my snack when I used to come home from school wasn't a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It was a bean taco. It was a, to a flour tortilla with frijoles. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, I grew up pretty pretty Mexican, very Tex-Mex, you know. But that's for the most part. It was it was eating off the land and, uh, and flour tortillas. Those are the two big, big staples in my life and still to this day in my life. I, I make fresh tortillas every morning for my son. And so he's the same way. He's like, can I have a tortilla for the car? Like, that's our snack. I don't know. <laughs> Is that Tex-Mex, Tex-Mex, its own thing and Mexican cooking, oh, its yeah. own thing? Yeah, totally different. Totally different. And um, both need to be respected because yeah. it was a time I remember I came to Washington, D.C. and who hired me. Rob Wilder, he had a Tex-Mex restaurant called Austin Grill. Uh -huh. And and for me, it was, was a discovery. I already knew Mexican cooking, but it's like the first time I had Tex-Mex. was the time that all of you will hear. You will hear criticisms of ah, Tex-Mex. But Tex-Mex has earned its own right to be, to be its own world of cooking. Mm -hmm. We should be respecting Tex-Mex, yes? I think so. It's definitely, I'll tell you, you know, Mexican cuisine is one of the only cuisines protected by UNESCO, uh, France as well, but it's only France and Mexico as an, as a cuisine in its entirety that you can tie back to the roots. Um, you know, that it, it, a corn tortilla is still a corn tortilla, you know, but a whole cuisine, like there's certain things that are protected, like the noodle in China, uh, the, the, you know, UNESCO protects the cuisine of Mexico as a cultural jewel. Um, and because of that, Tex-Mex is, it's not so far from it, but it is very different because it is, um, different ingredients. Um, 
And, and the thing about Mexican cuisine is the uh, endemic ingredients to Mexico, chocolate, vanilla, the chile, the tomato, the potato. Um, there's so many plants that are native to Mexico that have made their way. Even though the Italians made the tomato famous, it's endemic to Mexico. Even though Europe made chocolate famous and added milk and sugar, it's indigenous to Mexico. Uh, vanilla, the, even though Madagascar is the largest producer of vanilla in the world, it is endemic to Mexico. And the best vanilla in the world is Mexican vanilla. So, you know, I think Tex-Mex is like Mexican adjacent because it is very different from that lineage, from that heritage, from that thing. And so um, I think it is, it's, it's its own whole animal in a beautiful way. I love Tex-Mex. My husband doesn't like Tex-Mex, does not like it. That's okay. We have <laughs> the right to like and not to like. Uh, that's the freedom of, but listen, I'm sure everybody listening to you describing food is salivating as we speak. <laughs> and I want to bring this because I'm a chef and I have, in the last few years, I'm, I'm going to share with you here that almost I'm, I'm having this love and hate relationship with food. Mm. Everybody knows how much I love food. I'm cooking all day. But very often people will see me, I'm not even tasting or eating the food. Mm. Uh, I've been working very hard, especially the last four or five years, uh, in bringing my weight down to a place that is not about being skinny or, but it's about feeling good, yeah. about feeling better. Yeah. So, so I, I'm a chef that I realize that sometimes I don't even want to go to my restaurants as much as I go because I'm always bombed with new cocktails, new dishes, new foods, chefs that want me to try the new dish. They came up and they were so hard and it's almost disrespectful if I don't try even if you are feeling you are not eating, it's so many tiny pieces of food I keep putting into my mouth that even before I sit for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I feel I already had 5,000 calories. Oh. So you, you are doing all these shows about, about food, uh, uh, and you live at the same time in, in Hollywood. Uh, that uh, We have all, all, all these images that Hollywood, everybody, every star, every person needs to, to, to look and, and be perfect. You... you, you you look perfect, but, but I have this struggle of, of the love for food and understanding that too much food is, is not the best for me, for my health, for my yeah. body. Do, I try to do a lot of sports. What do you do, Eva? Do you, are you in the gym two hours a day, three hours a day? You, you control the, the quantities you eat because it, it's, it's yeah. always a way to, to eat right. What yeah. happened, we have this tendency used to overeat. We have two more tacos than necessary, one more margarita than necessary. It seems we always have one more plate of things our body doesn't need. So you see, the question here is deep in many ways. Uh, uh, it's about, it's a struggle for a lot of people. It's yeah. a struggle for me on the love and the relationship with food. Uh, it gives me joy, but at the same time I'm realizing it's like, oh my God, here I am overweight again. And I know it's millions of people in America, yeah. in Mexico, that they're going through through the same issues. What yeah. do you do to look so healthy, so perfect? Even I know that you love to cook and you love to eat your way around. Do you? Uh, what do you do every day use to keep in such a good shape? I do work out a lot, um, but that's for my mental health. I don't work out. Um, I don't work out to be thin. I work out to be healthy. And I, it's, it's, I, it's my, my hour a day that I love. I love being in the gym. I like sweating. I like endorphins. Um, I do it first thing in the morning. It sets my day up for success. Um, and I do love food. I actually get really sad when people do have a weird relationship with food because I think it's one of the greatest joys of our lives. And again, I, I think it's how you experience the world. And so um, I've known many of people who, you know, do struggle with that relationship, um, whether it's overeating or under eating, or just, um, always thinking about what they cannot eat. That stresses me out. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't live that way. I love experiencing food. I think my thing is like, it's in moderation. It's just in moderation. I mean, I, I, I you're a chef, so you, you have a very different perspective than 
I'm, I'm not a different perspective. You have a very different day than I do. Like I am not in kitchens everywhere being tempted by all of this stuff. Um, so when I am, it's, it's a gift. Like if I go to one of your restaurants in DC, it's a gift. I sit down, I go, oh, I'm tasting everything because this is not every day I get to experience this. You, on the other hand, get to experience it every day, all the time, many times with many people. You know, you travel the world. And so I get like how that could be difficult for you. But for me, it's like, I associate food with with people so closely that um, meals to me are about uh, an experience with with people and a conversation with people and catching up with friends and sharing moments and sharing a glass of wine and share. So so for me, that to to me is how I view I have a great relationship with food because of that, because food to me equals family or food to me equals friendship or food to me equals memories made food doesn't equal calories to me. Food doesn't equal weight gain to me. I have a very different relationship with it. But for those who are struggling, I mean, I feel like it's very confusing. You know, I remember I went vegan for two seconds in my life because I said, I'm going to try, I'm going to try this. And it was so confusing. And I was like, oh my God. So wait, I, what? So where, what, just tell me what to eat. I'm so tired, <laughs> you know, or then I was like, maybe I'm allergic to gluten. Cause I was like having this <laughs> bloating thing that was happening. And, and I went to take a test and they were like, no. And so I had to really think like, okay, what did I eat? That made me feel not great. And I think your body tells you if you're listening, your body tells you what it doesn't like, you know, me, obviously I have a great partner in my wife that she's been next to me. I will always tell everybody. Just find find a group of friends, your wife, your your husband, your best friend, uh, and and make sure you share those moments uh, with them, so you are not uh, alone trying to 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 eat less or, or be uh, healthier or, or to go play tennis. All of the above. Always find a partner. So that's why I wanted to share with you and, and thank you for putting your your thoughts. Mm. Uh, listen, Eva. Uh, the other thing I love of the many. Uh, about you and and I hope everybody listening to us right now knows. But I'm 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 amazed how you always find time, and we've been together in in, in many things in the past. Uh, I love your your activism. You you founded the Latino Victory, which you raise money for for Latino candidates. Uh, uh, you 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 are the founder of Poderistas, a, a digital community that amplify Latino voices. You. You, you are there. But on top of that, you, you've been producing documentaries, which brings a very deep, important light in issues that also have to do with Latinos, with undocumented. Uh, you, you, you did The, the Harvest, uh, uh, where you were looking at uh, child labor issues in agriculture. Right now it's an issue, so you were ahead, ahead of the curve, and, and thank you for that. Uh, and, and also the, 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 the documentary Food Change, the... Mm -hmm. Uh, where you de documented the struggle of the uh, in Mokali uh, workers in the effort to raise use one cent the cost of tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, amazing stories that bring light to to the hardships of people that fit America that seems they cannot uh, fit uh, uh, themselves. So you you are becoming you are an expert on those issues because you are next to those people that need to be given a voice and you've been giving them that that voice. What America needs to be knowing about about the people that make our food, and especially about the immigrant labor and about the child labor, because I think sometimes people don't get that it wasn't for those immigrants, many of them Latinos and many of them undocumented, America wouldn't have food on their table. Yeah, well, and you know it's interesting because during the pandemic, farm workers were, along with healthcare workers, um, were deemed essential workers. And I was like, they've always been essential workers. Like we didn't need a pandemic to tell us farm workers are essential to um, our way of living and our, and our food supply. Um, but that's why I do the documentaries is because we can talk here about statistics and data and how many children are in um, agriculture working, how many children are in many in meat packing. Uh, there's a lot of industries dependent upon migrant labor, but yet we don't want to treat them as humans or give them the human dignity of fair wages, of, of decent l working conditions, living conditions, all of it. And so um, you can't say, we need you 
to come and you know pick our produce, but uh, but you have to live in the shadows while you're doing it. You know that's not fair. Um, and so this immigration is a very big topic. But if you look at the guest worker program or or migrant labor programs, like there should be an easier approach, a more common sense approach to you know how we can uh, allow these people to come in and work and do the jobs nobody wants and live in peace and earn a living and then go back to their countries if they want to, you know? And so I think it's the, the, the hot topic, the hot button topic of immigration is pathway to citizenship. They don't, I don't want these people coming in and now they're going to vote, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about making sure they're not living in the shadows or living in fear. There's so many things that happen uh, that they won't call the police because they're not documented. And so uh, a woman was domestically abused, but she can't do anything because if she calls the police, she'll be deported. Um, you know, a woman was raped by her employer. You know, we had some cases in Florida uh, uh, of, of farm workers chained in the field, chained. And I said, wait a minute, this, is, this was like 2021. And I said, what are you talking about, chained? And who is the oversight of this? And, and because we look at migrant workers as less than, like they're not humans, they're less than, you know? And you're like, we shouldn't treat them this way. They keep our food supply going. If you remember during COVID, the thing that was always at the store was produce. We ran out of toilet paper, but we did not run out of food. And so... Um, for me, this is why I, I do so many documentaries is to humanize the issue, put faces to those numbers and statistics and data. Because if you see the kid who picks bucket after bucket of tomato on his shoulder for 50 cents a bucket, and those buckets must, must have 50 tomatoes each bucket, and then he goes to the store and cannot afford the tomato because it costs too much, there's a problem. The people that feed America cannot feed themselves. Thank you for bringing light to this important issue. And we are towards the end of this amazing podcast with Eva Longoria. And I said at the beginning that towards the end, we'll, we will be kind of cooking together. And everybody's going to say, how, how, what? Uh, Eva has a new, a new film coming. That is what she was premiering in Austin, South by Southwest. Flaming Hot. Flaming <laughs> hot. The Cheetos. She has a show about the person that uh, made movie. this happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're becoming, obviously, an expert because you've done this film. What is your theory of why Flaming Hot has become so popular? Because of the Hispanic market. I mean, this is what the movie is about. Um, I know how good is that. Uh, you know, the movie is about a Mexican janitor who worked in the factory at Frito-Lay. <laughs> and... Um, he worked at the factory Frito-Lay and he was, you know, couldn't read or write when he got the job or the application. And then he all of a sudden, you know, was like, I, I have an idea. Uh, nobody's paying attention to the Hispanic market. I have an idea. And he picked up the phone and called Roger Enrico, who was the CEO of Pepsi at the time. And Roger Enrico took the call. And he said, look, there's a huge segment of the population you're ignoring. We spend money on snacks too, but we, we put a lot of spice on it. If you would make a product for us, we, we would buy it. And he was right. And, and Flaming Hot is the number one snack in the world, in the world. That brand, not Cheetos, but like Flaming Hot, the brand Amazing. Flaming Hot. And there's Flaming Hot Doritos, there's Flaming Hot Ice Cream, there's Flaming Hot... Uh, clothing, there's flaming hot makeup, there's flaming hot sushi, there's flaming hot margaritas, there's flaming hot Mountain Dew. Like it is, <laughs> it has transcended the snack industry. So, people of longer tables, uh, flaming, flaming hot in Hulu coming very, very soon. I think it's in June. We all need to watch it next, yeah, next to back of, yeah, of flaming hot. Eva, my sister. My friend, my hero, I love you. Thank you for being You're here. You're my with hero, us and I tables. look up to you every single day for everything that you do for humanity. You are an angel, Jose Andres. I love you so much. We'll see each other again very soon. All right. In, we'll see you soon. In a long table in somewhere. In a long table somewhere.